Okay, so what did you want to ask, Joe? Uh, I was actually just going to ask about my mic, if it was okay, but uh, we can keep going. <laughs> the answer is, is we record at 2 p.m. whatever we have. Yep. And we just keep improving. Low here. touch. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So, Joe, thanks for thanks for coming on. Uh, what what is your status on this show? I have no idea. But I'll tell I'll tell you I'll tell you, and I'll I'll tell the audience of five people or whatever. I, Fifteen oh, viewers. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I think we're up to twenty five. I tweeted this. Okay, wow. That uh, show how I know you. I met you in person at an event that uh, Chihuahua Chen, uh, who's ex Kleiner Perkins, and then who ran his own fund. Uh, that's where we met in person, but I knew of your reputation because you ran a company, Clout, and now you run a new company that uh, is funded by Andreessen Horowitz, like myself. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's it's our, our our objective is just to bring a bunch of repeat founders in uh, and and to just talk about whatever. Uh, the the maybe we'll begin, and I'll I'll ask people the question that I think like it's, we're talking about a bunch of layoffs. So first of all. Any any thoughts about layoffs in general? As you see, literally the best companies doing it. Stripe, every every single person has. I don't know if it's happened. If you if you've done anything, you feel like you needed to do anything in your company. Uh, but uh, any any thoughts about what's happening? Are we in for like a deep winter at this point? What's up? I, I think the reason the layoffs are happening, and especially it's coming from the top down. So interest rates are up. That that basically means that higher risk growth stocks uh, are not as attractive to investors. And so they look to put their money elsewhere. And when interest rates are high, they could go into government bonds or some some other safer type of investment and get really decent returns. And so higher rates just mean less capital in the markets and then reduces the market cap of these companies and then the, their ability to pay people with stock-based compensation. And then uh, it, it turns from uh, investors uh, uh, investing in growth companies to value companies. And so the growth companies get squeezed to be more profitable and there's just a lot of pressure. And then people do layoffs and they try to get more profitable and they try to listen to their investors. And then it has major downstream effects from like, Oh, now I'm raising my B and the multiples that, that, that right. if I was going to IPO now, instead of them being 20 X, they're going to be compressed to five X or, or 10 X when I go public eventually. And so you'll see it go continue to go from the, Largest companies first, they'll get the most pressure, but you're going to see it kind of wipe through the, the high growth venture industry. And now we're seeing what who's doing layoffs right now. Facebook is supposed to be doing layoffs this week. Uh, we had uh, Open Door did massive layoffs. Stripe, which was a private company, did um, uh, a lot of layoffs. Really, everybody's doing layoffs in, in this March to become more profitable and i think what's being rewarded right now is uh like uh, essentially like the, the bet investors make is like your 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 potential for future cash flow and so that, investors want to see that the, the, there's the, a path there sort of like a, a maybe reductionist version is in 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 chubby times companies get chubby and so yeah i don't know if you've done it joe i'd love to get your perspective i your, you, I know your your company was never like super flush with cash. Mine definitely was, and my companies in the past got chubby. Uh, did you ever feel like you went through that journey? Yeah, I mean, we certainly overhired at Joy, at Cloud. Um, we never had to do a layoff. We kind of let the company deflate naturally. You know, people started bailing, and we didn't try to save them. Mm-hmm. Um, we did do a layoff post acquisition on some, you know, redundant, <clears throat> we got acquired and then, you know, the acquirer did some layoffs. Um, you know, it's not a fun thing. And it's when cash feels uh, never ending, it's easy to just keep hiring. Yeah. You, it, it, the Kevin, the, your, your thing that you said the other day was uh, you feel like God. That's, that's yes. what it feels like to be a, a, a hot founder that just got some, <laughs> really crazy valuation it's all about hiring 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 
<laughs> You've, and it, it, what you actually do is you're in a super precarious position on the edge of like a cl razor's edge cliff, but That's you don't right. feel that way, right? <laughs> I feel like I'm the only one who's only really ever operated on like shoestring budget <laughs> and r no one ever and just really, really, really cost conscious. Uh, and that was Nana the whole way up. So yeah. it's really interesting for me to hear about the, the, the stories of these companies laying off 10, 20% of their staff or even the, the we've overhired and we've gotten fat analogy. I think it's interesting, though. I mean, if you look at Facebook, if you look at Google, if you look at Stripe, if you look at all these companies, it's not that like going back to 2019, they're anywhere near flat on headcount. They've hired, I think it's like the number at Facebook, and don't quote me on this, is like twenty to 30,000 new people. Mm -hmm. So there was just so much headcount growth during the pandemic. And don't get me wrong, layoffs are horrible. And I yeah. feel really sorry for everyone that's infected. But at the same time, these companies so massively expanded their headcount across the globe. Like, and I think... I, that, that thing on... TikTok that went viral for a while. Like I'm a, I'm a PM at Facebook and it's just like some 20 something girl hanging out by the pool with her friends. Right. And she's like, I, I did some, I wrote a PRD or whatever, <laughs> you know, and be like, and that's my job. And it's like, I, you know, I, I don't know. Like uh, we, we used to, we used to be cockroaches, right. For a while. <laughs> now people are like proud of being a cockroach again. Or a I'm a cockroach. I'm going to survive nuclear winter. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think that it, like why why do these companies hire so so much talent? Like I think it's to go after really ambitious things, but also that's kind of like you as the whatever the management team or the CEO or the board. It's one of the only things you kind of have control over. Like especially if you are super profitable, like Facebook or Google. Like you want to go after all of these different things. They're tackling the metaverse, and Google has all of their other divisions. Like. What other levers do you really have other than just hiring a lot of people? And the thing is, and that I think that all of us probably recognize here, is that it's more people does not equal going faster. Uh, and it's, I, it's, it's actually the opposite. But you get that. I think, in, in, like, I, I've never actually ran in, like, a public company or anything like that. But I'm assuming that what goes to their mindset is just, like, this is our way to continue growing, to continue to, uh, innovating. And they're just not doing it in a way that's super smart, and it actually slows them down. And that's why you continuously see startups like uh, disrupting the incumbents. Is that you can take a WhatsApp type of size of company or an Instagram type of size of company, and you could disrupt these massive behemoths. So it doesn't more people does not equal faster or better products, which I think that the larger companies just get wrong. But I think it's kind of built into like. You have this money. What are we going to do with it? Triple. Well, it's not just the money. Yeah, it's. I mean, the money is clearly a big part of it. But you hire these professional managers. Mm -hmm. That's right. And the way they evaluate success and growth in their career is how many people are on their team. So, you know, there's like a pressure to hire all the way down the stack. Everyone wants a bigger team because that's how they show career growth. That's how their resume looks bigger. That's how they, you know, get more pay in their next role. Uh, so you have a founder at the top who's hungry to take on, you know, to thinks they can grow into a million different market positions. And you have yeah. managers all the way down who are building empires. Yes. That's yeah. right. They feel really good about it. And they're like, oh, my God. Did you, have you ever gotten it? I definitely, it's happened to me. And by, for the record, Andy, I was never a sexy company ever in my last company. Can't have it both ways. You can't be flush with cash and be a cockroach. Okay, all right. Fair. <laughs> Were you ever in a position where you actually went to your HR people and you're like, why the hell are all these job postings on the job board? And they're just like, oh, yeah, we just let anyone like put one on. No, it's it's a crazy world. I, I would I, that would never happen again in a in a company. But it's like that happens so much. Like, that's what it becomes. It does happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What do you guys have think? Any of you guys, have any of you guys been laid off? Like as an employee? Like yeah, 
does, a com- does your company know. failing count? Laying yourself off? Well, <laughs> I've had that happen too. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but no, I, I got laid off like, you know, eight months into my career. Uh, mm-hmm. And literally for a year and a half, sent resumes out and got maybe one job interview. Uh, so it sucks. I feel really bad for the people, especially, you know, early in their careers. Because I remember the one interview I did get, the hiring manager was like, hey, reality is we can hire a super senior person for instead of you. So like, uh, you know, in the market, when all these guys, all the fang companies aren't hiring, uh, it's going to be really interesting what the next kind of two years looks like yeah. for a talent. Because it's going to last a long time now, right? Like we've Mike Seems Solano like said it was going to happen, so it's official. <laughs> we we uh, it's it's now actually going to be tough for a very long time. Is that the perspective? I don't think so, but I'm an optimist. I think we're we're through most of the rough times. I think you, I think that it slowly will go into more of the higher growth private companies. Like they're not having to show their books and how much they're, they're losing on a quarterly basis. They don't have the external pressure that the public companies do have. So I think that we're going to, we saw some companies in 2021 raise some massive rounds and like that is going to last them regardless of how good the company is doing for a, a, a long time. And they will inevitably be, be forced to do some layoffs unless they change their business dramatically, which the chances of that happening are typically quite low. So I think there's still to, to come, but I think the number of layoffs that are happening, I would say that we're, we're definitely going to be on the, the downswing, my prediction. Yeah. Um, but on the startup side, also, I would actually th- throw throw this in here. I don't know if you guys agree with this or not, but I actually think like a, an early stage startup that is just uh, off their A round or B round is actually a lot uh, more of a, a have a, you have a safety net there versus working at some of these larger companies, especially in the downturns like we're seeing right now. I don't know if you guys agree with me, me on that or not that it's a better position yeah to keep your job i i agree with that generally i mean like you're at the early stages of your growth curve i mean people are value as long as your valuation wasn't 600 million dollars right uh, on a million of revenues you should be okay um my first job out of school i worked at lehman brothers this was 2007 uh so i've gone through a bankruptcy where right. we were all laid off but then we got rehired like about a week later and through, we went through a solid 12 rounds of layoffs. And we, it, the best way to describe what this was like is Survivor. Every Friday, you'd know the layoffs were coming. Mm. And like if you Brutal. got a call on your cell phone or on your desk phone, that was you. I think we started with an office of about 100. We ended it with an office of about 20. Okay. The weird, I left in 2009, but the weirder part is they started hiring everyone back. Sort of like what's going on with Twitter. And so a bunch of people just stayed on the sidelines for a year, didn't work, and then ended up right back in the same office at the same job under a different brand name. So that was weird. I've seen it. I've watched it. I was a little fortunate there. Um, I do agree with Kevin 100%. We're going to, Series A is a safe place to be. Series B is a safe place to be. Mm -hmm. Series D and E is where everyone's trying to cut costs right now. And public companies, I would say, are the most at risk so this of, brings of the sweeping layoffs. Where we were talking about it offline and the WhatsApp, because we have a just just for the for the five people listening, there's a 15. there's a WhatsApp associated sorry twenty five or whatever it is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's there's a there's a WhatsApp associated with this thing. Eventually, to turn into a Patreon, I'm sure, and. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> the the discussion around open door and what a uh, what a mess it is and how everyone thought that it was or sorry uh, maybe maybe you all should describe your position because it's not mine uh, Kevin someone else go ahead but also Julian you so for anybody that's listening you you have the most experience in the real estate right. industry so I'd love to hear your take but the headlines in open door. 
I think I think it was 500 or something employees laid off. Uh, the, now I actually saw their market cap is actually lower than the amount of capital they raised, yeah. and they were one of the high flying companies. So I, I I don't know their business model that well, but correct me if I'm wrong. They basically are an e buyer of homes. They will buy your homes through what, how whatever analysis they do through yeah. through AI. Let's call it. Uh, they'll they'll get a price and they'll give you an offer and they have super favorable terms for the actual seller and they'll take possession and, and for a buyer they make it really easy for you to go and view the home and everything but they actually have the home on their books so it's also it's a it's a negative cash flow cycle business which is kind of risky so I think the 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 big and and investors probably all when they were taking all the money they're like what's going to happen in a downturn okay you've bought all of these 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 homes what happens when you buy them for a lot higher than you could actually sell them and i think that's what's happening now as the mortgage market is like with interest rates rising nobody's buying they have a ton of inventory on their books i th- i saw in their last quarter i think they're now a negative gross margin but i think like a couple quarters ago they they were high flying they were doing great the 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 market was booming everybody was like saying how successful they are um, so that's kind of what's happened with that that business. I don't know. I'd love to hear your take, Julian. All that I will say is, is that fundamentally, real estate businesses in tech. If you're going to assume that there's a tech element, Breather certainly believed, and to a degree, there was a tech element. Although it turns out to be very finance operations, deals, and legal driven. Also, at the same time. But if there is a tech element, it's fundamentally about finding a super sophisticated underwriting model that actually right. works through what is traditionally referred to as the seven-year cycles of real estate, especially in commercial, right? Now, they're in residential, but it's fundamentally the same. And so what they did, and not to get too deep into open door, but like I know, I, as Keith Raboy would say, I know more about real estate than anyone in the United States of America. Yeah, you know more than Keith well, does? <laughs> that is what he said. We'll <laughs> no, put that in the show notes. <laughs> it's a real tweet. And and but the result is is if you if you find the places where there's a gigantic delta between let's call it the buy it now price right. and the selling price, is that there's an ability to to sort of in a, in a less risky way than usual, be like, oh, we're gonna buy a bunch of homes here, and we know that our underwriting model is sophisticated enough that we'll be able to make some form of margin on a consistent basis and basically like close the gap until eventually we can buy homes in New York City. Right. At, at the ultimate level of sophistication, right? And, and so uh, there are, why am I talking about this? Uh, it's because there's, I believe that there's eventually a marketplace for everything that will ultimately take over every business. And the places where it's the hardest to build marketplaces are where they're the most centralized and where there are the most uh, entrenched um, uh, self uh, interests. Real estate is almost certainly one of them where brokers and landlords like are control fucking everything and lock it down. Mm -hmm. And, and residential in weirder places like Tempe, Arizona, or however the fuck you pronounce it, are the places where you can kind of get a, like a little leg out. And so the, I, I think the cash, and it's why, it's why I actually think that Open Door is actually like a, real, a good business that will eventually, should it survive, like actually be good, is, is because there's a, there's a few places where you just need gigantic piles of cash to discover the underwriting model and to get to a place where it actually starts to make sense. Now, will you lose tons of money along the way? Of course you will. But if you survive, then you have a super sophisticated, I don't know if it's AI, it's just a really sophisticated underwriting model. And then you can say, okay, we can actually pump cash into this. It took us $500 million. I know it sounds crazy to like normal people, but here we are in this weird box where we can talk about this. If you pump $500 million into it and you get an underwriting model, it was worth it because this is the number three, uh, you know, uh, top thing in the GDP of the United States of America. 
And that's actually why. So Keith Raboy was one of the founders. That's he why it. he actually started it. It was that he, I think it was the story goes that Peter Thiel is like, we need to figure out a way to like, this is the number three piece of GDP. How do, how do we apply tech on this? I actually want to get everybody's opinion on this. What do you guys think? So this is this business model is very unique, right? This is a, a negative cash flow cycle business model where you have to put up money and then yourself and then you have to sell it for uh, whatever that product or service was for basically more than you paid for it. So it's a little different than traditional internet businesses where you spend a ton of R&D, you build a product, you charge an actual service, your server costs are very low, and then you're able to pay off uh, the R&D through your gross margins of your tech business, which are very, very high. I know, Joe, you, you obviously probably a Joy Mode had, had, had that. Yeah. Um, Julian, you probably had that with a, a breather. I don't know, Andy, if you consider uh, Nanit to, to be like that. I'm sure you could finance some of your inventory. What do you guys think of those type of business models? I I don't know if I would ever do one again. Because, but someone has to do them, and it needs to be someone who's an excellent financier. Thank God I discovered I was a really solid financier while building this business mm-hmm. because I didn't have the financing experience before that. But if I could not, if I was not a successful, basically, hype man or fundraiser, I would never have been able to survive in that type of building that type of business. Keith Raboy is certainly one of them. Elon Musk is certainly one of them, right, at the high levels. Adam Newman is certainly one of them. Sorry to say, but he was very, very good at it. Totally. And you have to be one in order to finance those models should something be possible in that space. Yeah, the idea of using cash as a weapon, um, I don't know, I liked it. I liked the idea of it. I didn't love how it turned out for me. <laughs> um, Do you want yeah, to ex- explain explain your business, Joe? Yeah, so Joy Mode was uh, the company I did after Cloud. And we we basically owned all the things that might be in your closet or garage. So, you know, from a stand-up paddleboard to a sewing machine to karaoke machines to barbecue grills. Uh, We own those things. We had a giant warehouse here in Los Angeles and we would deliver it to you. You would, you know, reserve it through the app. We would deliver it to you and uh, drop it off when you're done. Or we would come get it when you're done. So we would deliver 40, 50,000 pieces of inventory a week around Los Angeles. And these are all products we owned. So we would clean them, fix them, put them back on the shelf, get them back out the door. Super logistically intense, uh, you know, lots of financial engineering on how we bought those things and how, you know, what the ROI was. Uh, the problem actually wasn't in the unit economics of that business. It was like we literally just couldn't get enough customers. Like that was a company that had to be huge or dead. And that's basically true with all these kind of, you know, money powered companies is like you sign up for a ride that's like, you have to show so much growth that you can raise the next round of funding. And uh, we were growing, but it was too linear, not not exponential enough. And, you know, that the party stops. Were you, out of curiosity, he's getting a bit intense into the, the details, but were you growing as a function of your units that you owned? Yeah. So that was the other, you know, and you had to be really tricky on or really careful on like, all right, how much are we putting into acquisition? Because right. we don't want to acquire users and we don't have enough inventory, but we don't want to buy too much inventory. And then we have it sitting there because we don't have enough users. So it's like this constant uh, stepping, you know, like ladder of buying more stuff to have more users. Uh, we got really smart about how we utilized the inventory and then we were buying at big enough scale that we were getting wholesale pricing. Right. Um, so the, you know, it was really the return on the inventory wasn't bad. It was it was a cash management issue. It was like getting enough cash to spend it, and yeah. um, but you really need just like super hyper growth. And, and you, yeah, you it's super linear. You growth. you could definitely make that model work, right? Like one of the oh, yeah. best companies in the world, Amazon, right? Like. That they started off. They they have they have a few different lines of their business for the retail business. Like their one P model is they they will buy the products up front. They will warehouse it and ship it to you. That was how they started their business, um, and that obviously works. So as long as you can have the growth, anything you can make it. I, I wonder if real estate is just one of those categories that like 
the the dollars are so high that like the market fluctuates. And I don't know. I don't know if the, the, this this was similar to you, you Julian and Breather, but we we work like wasn't weren't the the early the, the, the early story was is that they were getting like really great leases and really great terms, and then as they were forced to grow, they basically just had to pay like really high lease rates, and then the, Wait, talking, we work. What are you talking about? We we work. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I I, th- I think that's how ultimately they ran ran into a lot of trouble that that. They, the, the initial model actually did work very well, but then as they tried to continue growing, their their margins get got slimmer and slimmer, and then they're holding on to like these ten or twenty year leases that they can't get out of. Market changes, they're just fucked. Um, so maybe it is industry specific. Maybe this deserves a whole a whole episode. It's actually it's not quite right, and it and it is a it is a good model, and and y'all know about Regis. You're aware of Regis as an idea. The, the reason that Regis and WeWork are distinct is actually because WeWork uses the design, and I'm like, I can't, I can't, this is probably not interesting to others, so I, at one point we're going to have to cut it off, but like, we, WeWork uses the design effectively to squeeze you into more square feet. It's right. just like, hey, look, here's a cool poster on the wall, here's like a cool standing desk, you go at 80 square feet instead of Regis that says... Hey, we're going to give you 125 square feet, and they're all ugly, right? Not to be the bearer of bad news here, uh, but Regis went bankrupt in 2021, and I also think they went bankrupt once before that. So I think they've gone bankrupt twice. They did several times. Each time that they did, (laughs) but they're still alive. In terms of bankrupt, provided the customers, they're still alive. Multiple times, folks. Several times. But the way that they were able to uh, continue to to do it is fundamentally that every time that there's a down mar- the down cycle, they're just like, we have to cut off the leases. We go bankrupt every time. And that's ultimately what happens in a cycle like that. What you hope is with a super finance business like Open Door is that they can say, we survive such that we're so good at surviving these up and down cycles that we can create a marketplace out of it. And that's probably... I, I actually think Open Door can be a very large long-term business i think what they're dealing with right now is you basically you had interest rates go from for mortgages for the average person go from like three and a half three and a quarter to seven percent over a quarter more or less and it's something they just were totally unprepared for and I, i don't know their markets i don't know anything about the company but let's say on average that means their inventory went down 10 20 percent so yeah they have negative gross margins because they're they have to take inventory write downs and it's just a it's a function of rates and what they're holding on their balance sheet and what they paid and it should normalize at some point then Mm -hmm. it just comes down to do you have the liquidity to survive and so i assume at some point this all normalizes and then you want to go buy open door stock i don't know when that is and i don't know enough about the business that's the thing i don't know either and it's it's uh but it it, it, and so you can see how what what people are doing so this brings us to the whole peloton dude who's now starting a rug business and raised 25 million dollars i was wondering if y'all feel i understand it's not healthy to feel but i was wondering if all of y'all any of y'all feel like repeat founders are like immune to the cycle because he's the founder of peloton so now he could just raise any bullshit anytime he wants for who knows if rug businesses are a good business i have no idea uh, whether any of you feel immune to the cycle because a repeat founder is a high, a rare, high value person to invest in or team to invest in. Yeah, or is he just so unique? Because he's obviously a repeat founder, but they found extraordinary success, right? So does he still think that that they could? Yeah, they. Um, who knows what his perspective on it? is but now him getting into a ddc rug business and raising 25 million dollars out of the gate they, you actually can't even they've announced the, the round you can't even actually buy anything off of their site yet <laughs> thought that was quite funny um but uh the rug business i looked uh one of their competitors ruggable uh they have 500 employees for a ddc brand that's massive so like they're they're bringing in i don't know i want i want to call it 500 million dollars in revenue a year most likely so this is obviously maybe this is like a casper type situation where you're just going to get a lot of people that figure out a, a a unique way to package the these rugs and that's one of the 
the the reasons that you could buy it online versus going into the store but there's definitely like an interest for this type of product i also i always think that raising so much money out of the gate just like i don't know any successful company that has raised over like 20 million dollars in a seed round that's been successful i think it just like you just hit too sloppy too early on you're hiring like seasoned execs like i would also argue and this is kind of gets into one of their other topics that, that we had like what are you, what are the, the first 10 people that you uh hired look like now versus when you started your first company like most likely when you raise 25 million dollar seed round you're going to be getting some like seasoned execs like you're paying them probably like 400 500 k or something like that and is are those the best type of people to actually try to find product market fit i would argue no uh i'd love to hear what you guys think i think it's kind of interesting because by i don't know that you really have to find product market fit in this type of business people need rugs you always do you have to sell rugs you always have to to do it at a cost effective price Cool. But that's the whole point. It's like, how do you, like, product market fit encapsulates everything. It's like, you're buying for lower than you're selling. And you could reach customers, your acquisitions and prices lower than their LTV. Like, that's that's product market fit. I'm kind of picturing a slide in the deck that says, once we hit 100,000 rugs sold, we'll have 50 plus percent gross margins. And I think I've seen this deck before. Personally, I need a rug, so I can't wait till they launch. Um, my use Ruggable; they're live I, right now. Oh, they are live. Okay, so I'm gonna no go Ruggable is their Ruggable is their competitor. Oh, okay. So this Ruggable is the one with 500 live. employees. Yes, so it's like it's definitely a, a healthy DDC category. I don't know any other brands that are in this space. So, folks, if you are listening and you're from Ruggable, we're taking sponsorship for this episode. For this episode, please. <laughs> Only for you. <laughs> well by the way which we'll play at the end of this uh we can find a way on it kevin thank you do not play the song right now <laughs> i'll play it the there is a 30 second fiverr clip so did you just pay you paid five dollars for this clip no it was like 50 bucks okay wow was, we got ripped off actually, <laughs> you got ripped fiverr off. is not five dollars by the way no, you can't buy anything on there for five dollars anymore oh, okay but, <laughs> yeah. nonetheless, we will play the clip at the end of the episode <laughs> I, but I, that's how I feel about Breather. I feel the same way. It's like I was buying square feet. People knew I, square feet were just, they're a high value thing. People need square feet. So it's like you almost don't need product market fit. Software is so much harder. It'll be interesting so? to see what their actual strategy is. Like, I mean, they raise a lot of money, but I don't know. Maybe they're planning to go acquire a bunch of companies and roll up the space. Rug, rug pun intended. <laughs> um, uh, so I don't know. And I also need a rug. So there is, uh, yeah, there's definitely demand. Like I've tried Joe to buy a rug on Wayfair yeah. and like I struck out. There's a reason I don't have Same. this rug. I just gave Same. up after it being such a miserable process. But do you guys honestly think that taking like that much capital up front as a startup is healthy for anybody? No matter what the business is, no matter what the like, what, what's an, a counter example? Um, uh, Meg Whitman and uh, the CAA guy they started the um, uh, content company. Um, uh, what was it? Quibi. 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 Yeah. Uh, they. What did they raise before they even launched? I think they raised a billion dollars. Um, yeah. I just think it just does not. Get, you don't get good habits into the business early on. You're not – I think constraints are good. This is one of the reasons that the incumbents, they they will get disrupted by startups. You could be a lot more scrappy and figure out – maybe it is a way to, like, package this rug in some unique way. But, like, Ruggable – not Ruggable, but the, the, the new guy, uh, the Peloton founder, is like, well, we don't need to optimize for this shit. But maybe that's the thing that actually makes them – actually win in the long run i think that having lots of capital it just is unnecessary early on and creates bad habits and also the people that you hire to find product to build an early product and to find product market fit you don't need to pay that much and those people want to hire teams they just as as you mentioned like they they want to have as many employees underneath them they're going to want to prematurely scale 
before they have true fit with their customers. It's just going to happen. You, you see yeah. the writing on the wall. I, I, I know that you're after your A right now on the edge close to a B. Yeah. The rest of us are in earlier stages. And I don't know about you. Like I, I took eight from Andreessen and crew during that financing. And I took two before I had 17 million on the table. It's just my situation. I'll just explain it. Yeah. And looking back on it now, I absolutely would have, should have taken, I, I have tons of cash, like enough to execute, but really wish I had a couple million extra bucks on the table and should have done it then. And so it's, it's funny because everyone during that situation is like, stay lean. You're going to be Okay. And then this dude just takes twenty five million, and I kind of wish I had done some version of that myself. But here's know. the here's the beauty: it forces you to be that cockroach, and 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 like Andy was saying, figure that shit out before you you can't use money to like mask an actual problem that you have. It's not it's not comfortable, and no means. I did the same thing. I raised my first round or, or seed two million dollars, like. We we definitely could have used a lot more, and we could we have gone faster, maybe. But I think that cons- that constraint, like bread creativity and being leaner, and just focus, just forced you to focus on the right things for your customers. But it's not comfortable. It's it's really tough. Well, what do you guys? What do you guys and Andy and Joe with your, with your companies now? What what, your, what was your opinion on raising your your seed and? And keeping it smaller, going larger. Joe, we you... did a yeah, we did a. Our seed was a little over six million dollars, so um, and that's the only money. And um, so I don't know what that is. I don't know, but it's certainly not small. Um, but it's not crazy either. Um, could have gone higher. Uh, I like having money in the bank too. Um, I don't know. I guess just thinking about uh, the Peloton guy, like Mark Lohr, isn't he another example of like, you know, super successful, experienced founder, came back out with Jet, raised a ton of money, and, you know, executed, I don't know, I guess executed well. I mean, they got <clears throat> acquired by Walmart pretty early. Um, in the, like in the venture people... world, was that a success, though? Yeah, yeah, I don't know what those three billion dollar like. exit, but the business yeah. didn't work. Is what Kevin's getting at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know that's a more main. The fact that they could get it, I don't know who the big rug acquirer is. Like Walmart had an existential threat in Amazon, um, so having getting that talent was valuable. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I'm curious though, like. I guess I'd love to see like what the the thesis underwriting this investment was. It literally, I Joe, I think you're right. It, it Andy was just saying a moment ago. Oh yeah, it's about fifty percent gross margins. And I think it's like we're Amazon starting with rugs <laughs> <laughs> because that's always that's always what the pitch deck looks like. Yeah, <laughs> they're gonna get into carpets and laminate flooring <laughs> that. They're they're gonna get into the uh, IoT space. I'm picturing <laughs> there's probably a con- there's got to be a content business here too. Obviously, being Peloton, right? Like, respect, respect <laughs> to anyone raising money. I know he raised it before, and he's just announcing it now or some shit. But like, respect to anyone that is doing any kind of fundraising and who wants to go at it again. This motherfucker, whatever his name is, Foley, does not need to do it again. He doesn't. And he was beat the fuck down in the public markets. They got beat down and he was, I think, forced out of the company. So total respect to him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I, this is that that I'm picturing the Theranos documentary where they talk about the big laboratory companies are coming after them. I mean, there is big rug out there. Rugs.com and all the other carpet companies on Mohawk owned by uh, Berkshire Hathaway. They gotta, re- they gotta be really worried about them. You can see the matrix, right? There's a four by, there's a two by two thing over here. We are D to C rugs. Plus, we're direct to consumer. This will give us five percent extra gross margins, or whatever the fuck they're saying. I, I, I personally, and I, I'm in this business, like so. We we help 
I would also I would love if if the, if the founder is is listening. I would love to for them to be a customer as ours. We could ship the rugs anywhere that they want. Um, but I think that D two C brands just in general, like Andy, you had one, but I'd argue that is more of a, a you're you're a hardware business, so baby monitors, and you had an actual like you have a monthly subscription on top of it, so it's not the same. But I think like consumable like hard goods it's really tough to like be defensible in that space. And that's why you don't see a lot of like venture exits. So look at the ones that did go public. So Casper, like they went public. I think their market cap is like sub $200 million are probably going to go private. Um, All birds, they, they went out pretty, pretty good, but um, I think their market caps can can crash down. They, you just inherently have just so much competition because you you can compete relatively easy and and your level differentiation is not as big as it is in a tech company that you're building these products and with like really highly skilled engineers over many different years um or if there is network effects there's definitely i don't think there's any network effects in a, in a, in a ddc rug company that i'm aware of or something like that but i think that's why like most of these are not venture backable definitely not after like series c or d i think they're good could be some good early angel um and a checks written to these companies but typically like i don't i don't see them and also like i look to go and try to identify the the brands that will scale so we look for things like defensibility gross margins um like all of these things um and there just is a lot like when somebody creates something that people like, there's just a lot of competition that just floods into the market and then will just raise their customer acquisition price. And then they're not able to acquire customers in the same way that they were before. And so they are great businesses for founders. So they don't take that much money, but they're not really truly like venture backable normally. Um, obviously, tons of exceptions. Consumer electronics is a huge exception on that. Um, but I, I don't I don't uh, from the outside look, looking in rugs, I don't think fits that bill. Joe, do you feel like you had you had your joy mode that you ran? You had a software business before that. I was like thinking at the moment, do you feel like you're burnt out on businesses that require any type of capex that require anything but software? And that's why you're doing what you're doing today. Or was the, the, the sort of space like more of like an open field for what kind of business you would start on the third try? There was a, a weekend at Joy Mode where it was like our biggest weekend. And we were breaking every record. And our limitation on growth became how many doors there was on the warehouse. Like we literally couldn't add more subscribers and more transactions because we did not have enough doors on the warehouse. And that was the moment I said, I really miss uh, <laughs> software business. Uh, Cause like there was not, yeah, there was just not an easy solution. There was no solution. Like we couldn't like to move to another warehouse, you know, it was millions of dollars and months of work. Um, so we, you know, we got creative and figured some stuff out, but it was like, we had these limiting factors that were so frustrating. It was really cool to be doing something in the real world and to have, you know, put that CapEx to totally. use. And I would get text messages every day from people sending me pictures of our vans across the city and, you know, and hearing the stories of how people use our products in the real world was really exciting. Um, but a software business and, you know, the instant worldwide scalability of that as a founder who you know wants to build things that impacts the world and wants to build things that are um you know that people everywhere can use is something you know i I don't ever want to get away from now so as a closing sort of the subject i'd love to hear what your first 10 employees were like in company one it was the first venture back company right clout then company two and company three and whether anyone transitioned in your business from number one to number two to number three like like meaning teammates follow you from company one to two and two to three yes so cloud you know the early requirement to get hired at cloud was that you were willing to quit whatever other job you had um like i didn't have you know, I literally had never met a person who worked at Google when I started that company. Like, I was really outside of the scene. 
I had, you know, I didn't have a bunch of friends I worked with, anything. Um, so if you were willing to quit your job, you got hired. And I went through a lot of people. Like when we got acquired, we were like 70 people. And then diligence, they were like, holy shit, you had like 500 people work here. Um, <laughs> holy so shit. I, <laughs> I was like, hire fast, fire fast. You know, a lot of you, you know, they're always like, oh, hire slow, fire fast. I was hire fast, fire fast. Um, <laughs> and we got, you know, we went through many generations of team and we got an incredible team over time. Uh, it goes to show you how when you do have product market fit, you can overcome almost anything. Yeah, you, can make really, you, you can hire fucking idiots and it yes. actually kind of doesn't matter. Like Mark Andreessen pretty directly says this, right? Yeah. I mean, we had real product market fit and you know, got to make a lot of mistakes, um, thankfully. Um, so the first 10 were very random. And, you know, a couple of those turned out to be gems and made it far into the company and have gone on to incredible things. But a lot of them were, you know, who knows where they are. Um when I started the second company, there were a few cloud people that came. It was, it was different, though, because I moved from the Bay Area down to L.A., and this was pre-remote work, and this was you know building a very localized company with geographic constrictions and stuff. So um, you know, a lot more investors came along for the ride than employees. Um, doing this new company, we're really small. We're six people. One of my co-founders is the first employee from Joybook. Uh, and, and now when I think about employees, like, you know, we're really senior, we're six people, but everyone is, uh, clearly a doer. Like everyone has to do everything right now, but they are people that I imagine having big teams as we grow. Um, they are all senior in their career. Kevin, what about you? For me, um, at ship, uh, I think I interviewed fairly good for, as a first time venture backed founder, but they most people didn't make it past like the series B. Either they got fired or or they left, um, got too burnt out. Um and they were very junior, just just like I was as well. So it didn't have a lot of senior people in. And tried to screen people the best that I could. Uh, definitely erred on the side of just enthusiasm for the business, and and uh, and also we were a hot company then as well. Um, so we got kind of lucky with some of the referrals that we got uh, in uh, even in our first ten people. For the second company with Airhouse, I actually did bring a lot of people from. So my co-founder is from Airhouse, not not an early employee, but one one of the later employees. And I wanted she was great on the go to market, and I'm much more product and engineering um, and finance focused. So great partnership there. And now we have like five that were from Ship um, so far in our 30 people that we are today. And uh, just like Joe, like we hire for experienced people right out of the gate. I would not want to get – so you, you want to hire experienced people. I, I personally don't like hiring from like the fangs. Um, I want people that have, are doers, but they're, they're, they have experience. Um, so I – like my engineering uh, uh, leader, like everybody, even the first people that I didn't even give like titles to, they were all super, super experienced. Um, and the goal was like, we're going to make this into a big fucking company and titles don't matter. Um, and the same thing with Joe, like as we grow, you're going to run a team kind of thing. So we definitely erred on the side of that for our first uh, hires. And I don't think I would do it any different. I was interviewing people recently for a, a head of product position because my co-founder in a friendly way, left a business we were placed for head of product and we have since hired this person uh and uh i would note that now i have like amazon zynga like top companies but still not fang company well i guess amazon is a fang company but but there seems to be a bloatedness just to me like i've never hired anyone from facebook i've never hired mm -hmm. anyone from twitter and and but like you it's like maybe tier two from a comp perspective. Like, I don't feel Amazon is tier one from a comp perspective. In fact, it's I know not. it certainly is not, right? And so that's not obviously the only factor, but I would interview people. I just recently did it from Google and fucking all these other companies. And I was like, I would leave the call, like I would hang up and I would be like, that guy makes 500K. 
what the fuck? <laughs> over and over and over again. And, um, and so the only, for me, there were people, a designer, Arno, and my co-founder, Ben Neville, uh, who, uh, and uh, later a guy, Denis, who, who came from Breather, designers and product people. And uh, I, my, my, the people at Breather, I was very fortunate. I did hire very seriously. Unfortunately, I never fired, almost ever. Hmm. And that was, so I had, a, I had a set of high quality people that I, in my, in my, I won't name them here, but like very quality people that I think were very good. And uh, I was really happy to have them, but unfortunately it wasn't dense because there were also lots of schmucks that were just sitting around. And the other side of it was the, I would let smart assholes stay in the business. And that was, that was a major lesson for me. I did that too. Yeah. It's because I was like, oh, but you know, I don't want yes, man. And the result of that was like, I would let smart assholes sit around. And so only a few people made it to, to maybe they didn't work with, work with me because they thought I was a smart asshole. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but you're uh, charming, Julian. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it, so that's that's my experience personally. What about you, Andy? Um, Nanit, everyone was a little bit older. None of them had worked with, at Fang companies. Everyone is experienced and everyone had built. This is going to sound crazy. Everyone had worked at applied material and built a production computer vision system. So we hmm. were going into electronics. We were going to go. We were going to be a camera to track breathing, sleep and movement which is a very successful consumer brand. And they had built really, really, really complicated electronics. And no one had consumer electronics experience. Uh, no one had worked at a Fang, but everyone had built r insane stuff before. And we pulled it off with a lot of luck, a lot of, a lot of Googling, and a lot of great product design. Um, and then... The first, and when I started Vowel, Nana was still going in on a tear, so I really couldn't bring anyone with me. Um, so my my co-founders at Vowel are people I knew, um, and basically the first ten people, I think almost all of them, give or take, are there are people we knew through the network. No one had worked at Fang. Everyone's a very strong engineer. Um, but I kept thinking about what you guys said about smart assholes and how you never want to have them around. I think we all have a story, and we, we all remember what it was like to have a smart asshole. And I think mm -hmm. all of us regret leaving that smart asshole in their role for as long as we let, let them for. Yeah. And it may, even worse for me, there's a smart asshole, there's a round of layoffs, and I saved them. Oh, uh, no. I, 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 and I'll never name this person, but like, and I saved them, and I would. I was like, looking back on it, I was like, "What the fuck would I do?" Culture. It, it, one of our values at Val is uh, work joyfully, and it's really important. You want to have fun. This stuff is stressful, folks. So being an entrepreneur is hard, and it's a marathon, not a sprint. And I say this to the team all the time. And I want people to do their best work when they're here, and I want them to have fun. And like, if you're miserable at work because there's a smart ass, a smart asshole around, that ruins the culture. And that's a big lesson I learned. It took me a while to learn it. And I, I think Kevin, Julian, I, I, I don't know if Joe has because he just fired faster than the rest of us. Kept these people around, and I regret it every day. No, I definitely had to learn that lesson the hard way too. Yeah, it's hard. It, like, it ruins culture and it ruins productivity and it takes all your other smart teammates and it brings them down because they're getting told oh, they're not. It's, it's it, cancer. It's, it is cancer. Culture matters. You have to want to win. Especially with managers, right? I think, isn't that the, the number one indicator of like, uh, of employees happiness is like how good their manager is so if you have somebody that's managing a, a, a team that is one of these types of people that is just like terrible to work with like you're just you're just gonna bleed people out like, and that's gonna kill you yeah i i, I go ahead i couldn't agree more um i won't make that mistake ever again i want how, people... how, how do you actually now how do you how do you weed out the smart assholes Good question. We've hired. We've been pretty good at hiring, and so I think it's just everyone's a little attuned to it. Um, 
everyone focuses on a culture fit. I mean, we're still early. We're 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 thirty people. Mm-hmm. We're build. Everyone here is a builder. Everyone here is trying. Everyone here is doing. I, I mean, my heads of are doing IC work on a daily basis. Everyone is. And yep. if you're coming to an early stage company to manage large teams, manage 20, 30 people, the only place you're doing that is if you have 15 engineers and you're the head of engineering. Because there's nobody else who's managing except for maybe sales. And when you have six, eight salespeople. Um, so everyone's got to be willing to roll up their sleeves. Everyone's got to be willing to build. And everyone's got to be willing to get dirty. And so you, the, the term natural athlete comes along a lot. And I mean, that's really what you're looking for. You're looking at an amazing engineer who can also manage you and also build process and who also just is a 10Xer. Do you, that, do you, uh, do you day, look that type of person that I tend to think about these days, a person that in some capacity is an amateur athlete, actually. And when I hear that someone is an amateur athlete, in some cases, I actually have somebody that was in the Sugar Bowl, actually, and successfully, and won, I guess, the ring or whatever the fuck. I'm saying American things I don't really understand, but a legit actual <laughs> athlete. And, uh, and the, uh, the result of hiring athletes is almost always great. And uh, I think that is something that, I skew towards, which is which is interesting and odd, but definitely something that when I see it, it really matters to me these days. Yeah, I didn't mean it in the legitimate athletes. I just meant it as someone who could literally roll up their sleeves and learn everything and be willing to be a doer and a builder. But I hear you, and I've heard that point a lot of time, and I've heard that point many times over. And so, of the ten people that you hired in your last company, just using your last company as an example, how many, you don't have to name anyone, of course, but how many were great, regardless of whether you hired them again, and versus how many, I mean, today you don't have the perspective exactly of your first 10 and whether they're great, but it's how many from your last company really were great and how many do you think that it takes to succeed? I think that in my last company, the, out of the first 10, I think up until like maybe six, eight months ago, and we we started the company in 2014, 2014, 2015, I'm trying to think. I, everyone but one was still there. Uh, one, two left to start their own company. Were they all great? Not, yeah, nine? they actually great? were. We got rid of one person on. who was not great. They They're were just... pretty damn good. That's. I don't that's... know if they were A pluses. But they were pretty damn good. I don't know. My number is like a few people, <laughs> maybe maybe a couple. I think they were definitely good for the time. I think you definitely go through. I think as a, as a first time venture founder, I think you just need to get the people to get you to the next stage, and that's what you should really be fo- focused on. Um, and that's I think we did a great job at Ship. We launched a product; people loved it. Um, we wouldn't have been there without the first people, but like most of those people did not scale and and were kind of pushed out of the company or left on their own because they couldn't scale. Um, I think that's different at, at Airhouse. Like now, I have people that have been around basically as long as I've founded the company, and that was definitely not the same thing at Ship. Um, but uh, that's remarkable. That you, your first shot, Andy, you were just 9 out of 10. Just just bullseyes. I mean, we hired a guy off Indeed.com. I mean, like, we used to post jobs on Indeed. <laughs> As a marketing, like, associate who scaled to VP of growth, managing millions of dollars of spend a month. Yeah, anybody like, listening to that, do not take that advice. That is not the <laughs> fucking norm. He was incredible, and he just started his own company and raised... And raised from Greycroft, and he's one of the co-founders there, and he is that unicorn. And there were a bunch of other people like that. We we had somebody drop out of college uh, as a summer intern, who I think ended up becoming worked for us for like two years, then left and became head of data science at a large law firm, and then head of data science at Candid, and maybe he's now head of data at Better dot com. I've kind of lost track of him. We had some interesting characters. I mean, we joked with him all summer, you should jump out of school. And then he dropped out, and we're like, oh, I guess you're coming to join us. I push people to drop out of school. I push him. We were joking, and he was incredible. I'm um, serious. 
He was an economics Drop major. the fuck out of school. It's a waste of time. He was an econ major, lacrosse player, and like didn't know that anything is. about code. And by the end of the summer, was built our website. <laughs> Joe, how many people at Clout were there at the beginning in the first 10 and stayed to the acquisition? None. Just me. <laughs> uh... <laughs> this, is the no- this is the regular story. This is the regular story. Yeah. I mean, we had again, we and some a few of those people were really great and have gone on to done great things, but they were early in their career and you know got leveled and you know transitioned out to like start again and um, you know, but a lot of them were very, very random, <laughs> like, <laughs> very random. Uh, so yeah, no one, no one in the first ten, maybe a couple of people in the first twenty made it. To the to the end though. Well, congratulations on getting getting it sold, right? Which yeah. is a given. Uh, we're at the one hour mark. It's a good opportunity for us to cut this. So, a couple things. I, I I say everything on camera, so I'll just say this on camera. Do not close your browser. I right, wait. We need it to upload. And then, second of all, we're going to show listen our listeners. We'll give them a treat of the Fiverr fifty dollar uh, soundtrack <laughs> at once. We're never going to play. It's it a again. rap. It's a rap. It's a rap. It has lyrics. It was all of Kevin's responsibility. <laughs> that is the end of the recording. See you next time. Stay in Bye. the browser. Bye. Hey, yeah, we keep it real and we bring you the facts. It's the Second Time Founders Podcast. Talking tech news, the show is a must. Not some billionaire trying to sell you their book. We're coming from a real place. Plenty ups and downs, got some insights. Join the discussion now. We being honest and raw, giving you real talk. We've been at the bottom and made it happen and much more. The Second Time Founders Podcast. More building, less talk.